Welcome to the arena. My name is Greg Sindelar, and I have the distinct pleasure of being joined by our land commissioner today, Dr. Don Buckingham. Don, thank you for joining us today. How's everything going? Everything is just going fantastic, and it's yeah. great to be on with you. Yeah, well, you woke up today in Texas, so that's got to be a great start to everything. That's day, right. right. Woke up in Midland and ended you woke up, up in, in Austin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Busy you know, day. that's the heartbeat of Texas, I always tell people, the heart and soul of Texas. Um, well, you know, I think the where I'd like to start in our questions is just find out a little bit about you. You give our viewers a little bit of your background, how you got into all of this, because you are a doctor, you're not uh, a lawyer, you're not typical for a, a politician, and you served in the Senate, you're now the land commissioner. Love to hear a little bit about your story about how you got to where you're at. Yeah, and no, I appreciate that question. And not only am I the first woman land commissioner Texas has ever had, but I'm actually the first physician ever elected statewide in Texas. So that's oh, I didn't kind know of that. fun. Yeah, and everybody wonders, cool. how the heck does a doc get into politics? And really, it just started with the fact that it's my opinion that government messes up health care. Yep. And uh, so I became an advocate on patient-centered health care right after I finished my residency and ended up being through leadership positions I had all across the country, being one of the most outspoken advocates against Obamacare, so much so that Bloomberg News sent uh, an individual down to interview me and see what that was about. And once that article broke, magically, I started getting audited. So by the fourth <laughs> audit, weird how that happens. Weird how that happens. So by the fourth audit, um, I figured they had just pushed me into politics. Yeah. So I ran for school board, and I, I joke that I ran for school board before we knew that was cool and so important <laughs> because educating our children is the most important yep. thing we do. And then Governor Perry had appointed me to the State Board of Educators Certification, and the educators on that board had elected me their vice chair. And Governor Dewhurst had put me on the Sunset Commission, which is one of my favorite things that Texas does, limiting yep. the scope of state agencies and being sure they're fulfilling their mission. Yep. And then my Senate seating came open, and it's just been from there. <laughs> yeah. And so what was the thing that made you decide, you know what, I want to run for office? Because that's a really big step, right? Like to get into the arena, it's, you know, it's a lot for your family. You had a lot a successful life. You, you know, you're married, you got, hus uh, you got kids. You know, it's a, it's a big step to take. It is a big step and, and financially very detrimental to my family. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Um, with the impact it had on my medical practice, but worth every minute of it. Because I just believe you got to get in there and fight. Yeah. Um, and it's not always enough to just fight from the sidelines. Sometimes you have to get in into the arena itself. And even though it's bloody and even though it's awful and even though there are days that I wonder why the heck do any of us <laughs> do this? Um, I love what I do and yeah. I love being in there fighting every day and doing the best I can for Texas. Yeah. And so what was your favorite thing about being a senator? The other senators. <laughs> so the Senate is really a special place. Yeah. We, we life together. Um, yeah. we're, we're friends even when we have different political opinions. You know, most people don't realize that the Texas Senate votes bipartisan yep. almost 98% of the time. Mm -hmm. That being said, when we trench in and fight on our partisan <laughs> issues, we trench in and fight pretty hard, which yeah. is what, what we need to do. But uh, we all get along. We all appreciate each other. We can separate the personality or the person from their politics. Yeah. And I think that's really healthy. And I think that's one of the big differences as to why Texas works so well and Congress not so much. Yeah, that's right. That civil discourse is an important part of a healthy society, right? Um, what w Your time in the Senate, what was the thing you're most proud of? What was your biggest accomplishment that you you look back on you're like man I can't believe we got that done you know there were so many things mm -hmm. it was fun to help lead on constitutional carry mm -hmm. fun to help lead on the heartbeat bill and yep. almost nearly abolishing abortion in the state fun to um to lead on just a lot of things across the board I carried the star spanger ba star spangled banner bill yep. to make sure that our professional teams were playing the star spangled banner before their games because <clears throat> some had stopped yep. Yep. so we wanted to remind them they we do it to here do that. for every mill <laughs> I love that you know but honestly one of um, one of the little things you wouldn't realize what a fight it was was beer to go so is the fact that our little craft breweries yep. couldn't sell any of their product off premise um, or you couldn't walk out with any of it. And yep. while that seems little, it was actually one of the biggest fights of the session. But I was sticking up for the little guy. I was sticking up for their liberty. and We were happy to get it done. Yeah, I know, I know the uh, owner of uh, Live Oak Brewery, and he was very, very pleased about that. And it was, it was a big fight for a, a lot of those little breweries like that. Um, so you had a successful your Things were going great in the Senate. What made you decide to take the jump to run for statewide office? You know, sometimes God just opens that door and shoves you right through yeah. when you don't think you're ready. It was not my plan, um, but somebody had come to me and said, hey, George P is going to run for something else. It's kind of before it was known. 
and they said, we think you ought to be our next land commissioner. And I responded, my response was, well, I'm going to pray about that and ask my husband, which is a polite way of saying, no, thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> uh, and then I, I really feel like um, it is helpful to have served in the legislature mm -hmm. before you're a statewide. You have the relationships, you understand how things work. Um, and I felt like that's what our general land office needed because this office right now is literally the tip of the spear mm -hmm. in defending oil and gas, our yep. history and our border. And I looked around, I tried to recruit another Republican who was in the legislature and nobody was interested apparently. <laughs> so uh, I jumped in the race, but honestly, it was such a good fit yeah. and God knew what he was doing and I uh, love what I do. Yeah. Well, I love what you do. I, I have the uh, honor of being appointed to the 1836 commission. And so you're doing a lot of great work there. Um, could you kind of talk about some of the stuff the, the land commission is doing to preserve that history of our, the Texas founding? Yeah, let's um, let's run through what we do real quick. Yeah, because uh, we are the last remaining governmental entity founded by the Republic of Texas, which I take very personally because yep. I'm a ninth generation Texan. Uh, we believe we were the original land grant, although ironically, the General Land Office one of their first judgments was against my family in favor of some guy named Austin, oh. even though we were there when he showed up, uh, and we were the British consul. <laughs> not that you're keeping uh, track. Not that right? I'm keeping score, or that we might revisit that case from 1836. But um, I'm teasing, of course. But you know, we're the British consulate to the Republic of. Texas. Texas. So that stuff runs pretty thick in my veins. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when, when we were transitioning, we were unique because we were coming into the United States as a sovereign nation, but we had lived under many flags and we had to figure out who owned what because of that. And so we were founded as the keeper of maps, the guardians of Texas history, and the steward to what today is 13 million acres. That is transformational in modern times because that is how Texas is producing almost half of the oil and gas for yep. all of the country when the Biden administration has been able to shut down drilling mm -hmm. on all the federal lands, you get to all those other states that joined the union, their unowned land became uh, federal land. Yeah. And so they're majority federally owned. So they haven't been able to do what we can do. Yeah. Uh, so I love that part of it. So we unapologetically defend oil and gas every day. We're trans transformational for it. We're being transformational on the issue of produced water and the reinjection of that, that may be causing the earthquakes. We're helping them to get to carbon neutrality with carbon sequestration leases. We're fighting the good fight, filing a lawsuit on the LNG policies <laughs> of Biden. We're fighting on all the endangered species stuff. We've got some unique pooling agreements yeah. uh, to help us get around some something about a sand lizard. I'm, I'm teasing, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, a little bit going there. Um, but then we do everything coast, clean up oil spills, mm. rebuild habitat, renourish beaches, get rid of derelict vessels. We do everything big disaster recovery. All the floods, fires, and hurricanes were the ones who do the HUD um, disaster recovery. We run a lot of our veterans programs. Most people don't even know yeah, that the state of Texas is the only state that has a mortgage program for our veterans if mm -hmm. they want to buy a house renovate a house or buy some property. Yeah. We also run nursing homes and cemeteries on that. And then we get to the Alamo. Since you mentioned 1836, which I was asked in a panel here earlier today, what is the single most important thing I think I'm doing? And it is getting the Alamo right. Yep. Because it matters to every Texan. It matters. When we travel, we don't say we're Americans. We say we're Texans. Texans that's and it right. doesn't matter where in the world I have been. The answer back is remember the Alamo. Yep. And so because it is literally not just the shrine to Texas liberty, it is the beacon of, of independence, of fighting against all odds, laying down your life for your families, your friends, and your beliefs. Mm -hmm. And it is, inspires an, the entire world. Yep. And, and let's be honest, we showed up to the Alamo. You brought your visitors, and they've been dying to see it. And they sort of said, is that it? They yep. arrived. There's a busy First street in front of it. First time I went, I was like, it. wait, this is it? Yeah, 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 I actually had someone ask me, why did they move it into the middle of downtown San Antonio? <laughs> so so what we're doing, and um, I have to really give a shout out to Dan Patrick, Greg mm -hmm. Bonin, Joan Huffman, um, and Speaker Phelan was very instrumental in the $400 million that mm -hmm. we got from the legislature. And everybody, I think, still has post-traumatic stress yes. from Reimagine the Alamo. Yeah. So I want to be very clear, we're not doing any of that. <laughs> But we did just break ground on an educational center for our kids from early childhood through high school. We're mm -hmm. going to be teaching our Liberty Love and Line in the Sand, Liberty or Death history. We're building a 100,000 square foot museum that will set the Alamo in the context of time. Early Texas indigenous people, obviously most of it dedicated to the battle, but all the way through current day and the Alamo's continued effect on pop culture. Yeah. We're going to have a 5D movie studio. So you're going to sit behind the defenders your seat is going to vibrate when those cannonballs hit. You're going to smell the gun smoke. And so we're going to 
really come in and make an experience worthy of the significance of the events that happen there. That's awesome. I love that. Well, and, and you know, as, again, as someone who's on the 1836 committee, um, just very grateful for all the work you're doing because so too many of our residents just don't truly understand the importance of of that history and the fact that we're all stewards of that that history and when we're we inherited that and now we're stewards of it and then we have to keep that going and it's time to be loud and proud yeah, about it exactly and what a lot of people don't realize is the defenders were a very um heterogeneous group yeah they were protestant they were catholic they were anglo they were latin they were african-american yep. so a lot of people just don't even realize that the, the story of the alamo is for every american yeah, every yeah, Texan. That's right. And as soon as you move, you know, I'm one of those uh, Texans that got here as fast as I could. Uh, <laughs> now my wife gives me a lot of hell about it because she is a native Texan. But um, you know, once I always tell people, I was like, once you come here, that is your heritage now. You yeah. know, and and that's that's something special that a lot of other states don't have. And so Texas yeah. moves into you once you move into that's Texas. That's hundred percent right. Hundred percent yeah. right. So as you're looking forward into the future, you talked a little bit about what's going on at the Alamo. What do you see? maybe uh, the legislative uh, side of things that you want to see happen that would help you or what are the things that maybe the general land office is doing that, you know, we should be looking forward to? Well, you know, the general land office, it would be um, improper and, and illegal for us to lobby on any topic. Yes, true. Uh, so <laughs> not get, I'm not trying <laughs> to get you in trouble. We're just here on doing all that. <laughs> but what I will say, another exciting thing that the legislature did for us last time is for the first time ever, we're going to have a law enforcement division of the Alamo. So I say it with love. Um, the Alamo may not be the San Antonio police's top priority when we have something going down there. So last session, the legislature did give us, give us the ability to found a police force. Okay. So we're going to have our own law enforcement division there and really be able to protect that shrine of Texas Liberty. It's kind of cool to be, you know, police officer at the Alamo. Seems like a really actually pretty cool job. Um, so when you look at, you know, some, some point you'll move on to something else or you know, retire or whatever. What's the legacy that you're wanting to leave behind as at the, the land uh, office? You know, we do so many things. Um, I want our veterans to know that we love them and we honor their sacrifice and we're taking care of them. I want our coast to be protected. I'm a big uh, outdoors woman. I love to hunt and fish. So that's really important to me. Um, we want to help our Texans recovering from disaster. But again, it's, it's the Alamo and getting it right and being sure that the Alamo is standing 500 years from now so that we can be teaching our kids our proud history. Yeah, I love that. All right, so uh, kind of last question uh, for uh, give you a chance to wrap up. Is there anything else that we missed that you want to cover? But, you know, you mentioned early on that you woke up this morning in Midland. You're, you're here in Austin now. Um, but you travel all around the state. Obviously, the land office covers the entire state. Can you tell me about some of the most unique places that maybe the average Texan doesn't know about? And then I think the thing that is always the most interesting is like, you know, when I go to small towns or I go to some of these places I haven't been before, it's like I want to go to like a local restaurant, a local eatery. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the places that we're out and about in Texas that we need to make sure we're checking out? Well, in the Senate, I had been there to Temple to Abilene, 20,000 yeah. square miles, the heart of Texas. And of course, I love all of that. Um, in there, San Saba is one of my favorite little towns, oh, yeah. a little over an hour drive from Austin. Great for a trip. Lovely wineries, some lovely gift shops, an olive oil and balsamic vinegar store that rivals anything I've ever seen, which you would not expect in such a small town. Yeah. Um, in East Texas, Jefferson, Texas is a complete jewel, very close, <coughs> excuse me, to Caddo Lake. It's lovely. Yeah. So fun. Um, lots of New Orleans wrought iron because the steamships actually used to come up from New Orleans yeah. to there. So that's been super fun. And then when you get way out to West Texas, Marathon, Alpine, and we have just, I love every square inch, but every part of it has an amazing place. And if you're looking for the best gas station food in all of Texas, my opinion is the um, Diamond S in Bangs, Texas. <laughs> Diamond S in Bangs, Texas. So I have to ask, where is Bangs, Texas? Just outside of Brownwood. Uh, just outside, but it okay, is yeah. yummy. Okay. Definitely Diamond worth the S stop. Diamond S in Bangs, Texas. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm going to try that because I'll be going through there uh, later uh, next month. So I'll It'll have to be right there on the right as all you right. come into Bangs. <laughs> oh, man, I love it. <laughs> Well, is there anything else that you would want to make sure that the people listening understand about, you know, the, the work that, that you and your office are doing or the things that are really important to, to Texas? I want to make sure to give you kind of a, a closing opportunity, if, if you will. Well, I appreciate that. You know, I got to make Texas bigger for the first time in a few hundred years, declaring a couple islands in the middle of the Rio Grande, Texas. And that was important because in our fight for the border, 
um, these islands were basically law enforcement free zones before mm -hmm. they were declared neither Texas nor uh, Mexican law enforcement or military could get on there. So we declared them, we cleared them, we put the wire on them with the help, of course, of DPS and the military department. And so getting that complete operational control of that section of the border every place we can, incredibly important. I love the Alamo, of course. I love every square inch of Texas. I love helping people recover from disasters. And we're just going to keep fighting for everything that we believe Texas is, loves, and does. Love it. Well, Commissioner Buckingham, thank you so much for being in the arena, doing what you do every day for, for all of us in the state of Texas. And thank you for joining us here uh, today on, on, on this podcast. And, you know, I, I think oftentimes we don't recognize the sacrifices that it takes to, to do this and to serve. And so I just want you to know that we're very grateful for, for the service that you provide for our state. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. God yeah. bless. Yeah, God bless. Well, thank you all for joining us on the arena. We've had the distinct pleasure of being with uh, Commissioner Buckingham and look forward to seeing everyone on our next episode.